Welcome back to the 13th edition of the ESPNW <laughs> Women in Sports Summit. Please welcome to the stage two-time Olympic gold medalist, two-time FIFA World Cup champion, and current in ESPN soccer analyst, the amazing Julie Foudy. Oh, 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 I knew my mind. I like the back of my hand. Okay, 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 thank you, Andy, for that. Monica, true story, Monica McNutt stole my walk-up music. And they're like, oh, yeah, you stole it. And then Girls Run the World. I know it's not anything original, but I was like, well, then let's just go to the Indigo Girls. Uh, wow, this looks really good tonight. You guys look very casual, very comfortable. Is that because you drank too many beers playing kickball? Yeah. I heard about you kickballers. Who played kickball tonight? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry I've ignored this side of the room down here. <laughs> uh, uh, how about our pickleballers, huh? We crushed it. I did not make any candles today. That's not really my jam. I'm not gonna be doing that here at Ojai. No aromas, no candles. Um, we, I get to introduce, this is one of my favorite things we do here at the ESPNW Summit. Um, and I don't know how familiar you all are with the Global Sports Mentoring Program, but little bit of context, it's a sports diplomacy program and a partnership between ESPNW, U.S. Department of State, University of Tennessee, and as you know, we have the great benefit, as we've been talking about over the last two days, of having this incredible law called Title IX, one of the most profound civil rights laws that we kind of tore up to shreds today, by the way. <laughs> we shot some holes in that one. But all in all, stay on the positive side, it's been a great thing. Um, and there, as a lot of people know as well, you have all these people, I don't know if it happens to you, I get a lot of women coming up to me saying, how do I get Title IX in my country? Or how do I get access? How do I get opportunity like Title IX has afforded you all in your country? And so as part of this program, part of the catalyst was, could we bring these amazing women from all over the world together and create something where they're empowered to do an action plan and then take it back to their country? So. Is that up yet, Andy? Throw that up there for me. Look at, look at what's happened. This has been 10 years. This is the 10-year anniversary of it. And the power of what they've done, when you look at these numbers, 98 delegates across 69 countries. Those are the number of action plans, 2,072, that they've actually done. They've had over almost 350,000 participants in either sports-based clinics or workshops. So all of this work they're taking back from learning here and doing these incredible mentorships, they're taking it back into their countries. And this is the result of that incredible program. I think we all agree. So. Without further ado, two women who are largely responsible for all of this um, that I would love to introduce. Uh, the first one is Dr. Carolyn Spellings, also known as Dr. C to the, to the delegates. Uh, and Dr. Spellings is the Chief of Evaluation, Research, and Account Accountability at the Center for Sport, Peace, and Society at the University of Tennessee. And she also co-leads the U.S. Department of State and ESPNW Global Sports Mentoring Program, has more than 15 years of experience working globally with underserved populations. Put your hands together for Dr. C. No, no, no. I didn't see We bow. We bow to you. Uh. I'd also like to welcome another doctor. We only allow doctors on the stage. You know I got an honorary doctorate. I'm a doctor too. Absolutely. Dr. Yeah. Fowdy to all of you from here on out. Um, <laughs> Dr. Ashley Huffman, who is Chief of Sports Diplomacy at the U.S. Department of State, where she's the leading advisor on international sport policy and international exchange opportunities. Before joining the State Department, you guys probably already know this, Dr. Ash was a professor at the University of Tennessee and the co-founder of that 
very Center for Sport, Peace, and Society. And in that role, Dr. Ash helped launch the Global Sports Mentoring Program. She is a badass, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Ash, get on up here. Yes. What's your walk outside? What's your walk outside? Oh, 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 oh. Ah. Uh, I am... Um, I have so much immense respect for you two and what you have built. So thank you for all you've done. Dr. C, let's start with you. And if you would, just maybe give some context to how it works. When the delegates come over here, what do they do? How long do they spend? What kind of companies are they going to? All yeah, great. So it's a five-week mentorship program. Um, and when the women get here, we spend the first week together in Washington, D.C., where we go through our Strong Women, Better World curriculum, where we really start to learn from each other and hear about the different challenges that the women are facing in their communities. And we start to brainstorm solutions together to really get them prepped and ready for the second phase the mentorship phase of the program. And this is where they go out um, to our amazing mentor organizations and mentoring teams, which many of you are here tonight. And they go and they meet with their mentors and they work with their mentoring teams to think about how can I use sports, take what I'm already doing and amplify it to create more opportunities for women and girls in my community to address a pressing so social problem that's happening in my community just to elevate uh, women and girls and empower women and girls. So they end the mentor uh, we are here now. This is week four of the program at the, at the summit. We're here to learn and be inspired, and we definitely are learning and are inspired by all of you here. And then next week is uh, the last week. We'll head back to Washington, D.C., where the women, the delegates, will present their action plans to their sisters, to State Department representatives, to other GSMP program partners, and to many of our mentor organizations. Oh. And then they go home and they create change, and they do amazing things. Yeah, as we saw on yeah. that slide. Yeah. They go home empowered. And last year, it was virtual, I know. So it's great that they had to do all of this because of, thank, thank you, COVID, again. Uh, but they had to do all of it virtual. But then this year, they actually, a lot of the same delegates, they got to come. There's 15 of them from 15 different countries. Ash, give us a little bit of context in terms of the breadth of the projects some of these women have done over the years. And I know there's 10 years of it, 69 different countries. But what are your, some of your favorite projects they've done? Jules, I'm a diplomat. I don't have favorites. Um, oh, right. But right. I will say that there are some incredible examples that stand out. So whether it's Shiloh <laughs> Curtis, who created an entire women's professional league in Australia for Aussie Rules football, or Julia Vigero, who's in Brazil and yeah. created, built the first stadium run by women, for women, to have a safe place to play in all of Latin America. So those are some incredible examples. But I will just say, you know, GSMP is a revolution. It's one woman empowering another woman, empowering another woman until all are free. And so that's what I see. I see women working, these women are working from the bottom up, top down, and they're doing the gritty head and heart work, but also reforming systems that don't work for us. So it's disability rights, it's sexual assault, it's breaking cycles of poverty and violence, it's creating campaigns for LGBTQ in countries where being LGBTQ is punishable by death, by stoning. And so I just think, you know, when our buddy Arthur, who was in the Title IX talk, said, justice will never right itself, we must fight for it. And I think yeah. this is the fight. This is yeah. the moment. These are the women. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Let's just put that on a reel right there. <laughs> oh. You just celebrated the 10th anniversary of the program. You had a huge reunion in Washington, D.C., which I heard was great fun. I'm so sad I missed it. Forty different delegates from around the world came in for this reunion. Billie Jean King was there. Dr. Joe Biden was there. I mean, it, they had a party. Tell us all about it. Oh, it was amazing. I mean, for us to be able to bring these 40 women together across every year that we've run the program, um, from 33 countries to see the synergy of what they have been able to do individually and collectively. It was just like a big family reunion. And to be able to celebrate them and the hard work that they've done and to celebrate the mentors knowing that they've continued to pour in to these women to help them achieve and get where they are. It was, it was amazing. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, and I think, um, you know, one thing, w well, when we first started this, um, I was just a baby nugget, uh, and I had a lot <laughs> fewer gray hairs, um, but just reflecting on it, seeing the scope of it there in Capital One Arena, and, and that the First Lady of the United States is there opening it. I mean, what an incredible celebration, and so deserving for the program. And I think about, you know, all of the mentors that have invested so much energy and time sitting in this audience, like making it what it is. And, you know, I think specifically when something is replicated, that's how you know it's really good, right? So I think about Julie Patterson, the GSMP alum from New Zealand, who is launching her own GSMP next year. Mm. And New Zealand will be the mentor site, and the Pacific Islands will be the delegates. And so you know the sauce is good when people buy the recipe, right? Like, and that's what's happening. She's being funded to do it. And you know, I just think it takes all of us. It takes government, it takes business, it takes media, it takes academia. And so I just see the transformation and change is happening, it's unfolding, and I'm so happy to be a part of it. Do you think she would expand that so that people from like Southern California could go do it? <laughs> totally. I feel like that's Pacific. Yeah. Right, that's yeah. kind of yeah. the Pacific it's island. Kind of Pacific. Kind of. Uh, so she's actually doing the entire GSMP program. She's taken this model and said, okay, I'm gonna plant it here. Yes. Oh, <laughs> I was like, yes, Laura? <laughs> Gentilly in the front, keep it down. <laughs> Out of control up here. Uh, so she's taken that in New Zealand and said, I'm going to replicate this. Totally. Yeah. Uh, and found $300,000 yeah. to fund it already, Yeah, which is incredible. I mean, her, uh, yeah, her government's supporting her. Other private organizations are supporting her. It's amazing to see what she's been able to do. Uh, incredible. Okay, should we meet the delegates? The best part of the entire ESPNW Summit. Come on up, you rock stars. 15 different delegates from 15 different countries. You are going to meet up here. Hey. Oh. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's go. Yes. 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 You guys are looking awesome. You look great. Looking good. Yes. 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 Look at all these jerseys. <laughs> 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 Go ahead. You're going to introduce yourself. So you start from the end. Hello, my name is Fatma Ahmed from Zanzibar, Tanzania, and I've been mentored at the University of Connecticut. <laughs> Hello, I'm Jomana Atiyah from Egypt, and I've been mentored by ESPN. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Hello, my name is Sofia Bekatoru. I'm from Athens, Greece, and I've been mentored by New Balance. Hi, I'm Marina Drashkovic. I'm from Croatia, and my mentor organization is U.S. Tennis Association. Nice. Hello, I'm Christine Fong. I'm from Hong Kong. I've been mentored by Sachi and Sachi. Yeah. Kia ora, I'm Luciana Garcia Chinta from New Zealand, and I've been mentored by Stacey McCallum from DraftKings. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Veri Naimere. I'm from Kosovo, and I've been mentored by Big East Conference. Hi, everyone. I'm Mimi Sen, you here from Nigeria, and I've been mentored by Women's Sports Foundation. Hello, I'm Fuzia from the Kingdom of Morocco. I'm being mentored by the NFL and the Green Bay Packers. Yeah! <laughs> Hola, I'm Brenda Moller from Mexico, and I was mentored by the NHL. Nice. Selamlar herkese. My name is Kiraz Ejal from Turkey, and my mentors are New Balance team. Hello, everybody. I'm Corinne Sendo from Israel, and I was mentored by the NCAA. Hi, everyone. I'm Kritika NS. Namaskara as well. Uh, I'm from India. I was mentored by uh, Chin Wong and Cheryl DiCarlo from ESPN. And I also want to give a shout out to my mentors from last year, Liz Gray and Julia Sheeney, who are right here. Love you guys. Oi, my name is Beatriz Vaz. I be mentored by Julia Edma and Dai Comas. Uh -huh. <laughs> from Double Verify. And I love you, by the way. <laughs> Gamar Joba, hello, hello. <laughs> I'm Katie Van Zazanashvili, or just Katie for friends. <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> and fry, I'm from Georgia, the country. <laughs> now I say, not this Georgia, the Georgia. Yeah. <laughs> and I've been mentored by amazing Gatorade, <laughs> Molly, Sarah, and Megan, I love you. Woo! <laughs> Can you give them a big round of applause, please? Thank you, guys. Thank you. Great job. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Brenda, you're staying with me. Stay on up here. You're staying. Yes. 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 I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Georgia, the country. <laughs> Brenda. Moeller, as she uh, said earlier, is from Mexico, and Brenda has been with the NHL, and she has been working with Susan Kohig, who is Executive VP of Club Business Affairs with NHL, also spearheads NHL's women's hockey initiatives, but most importantly, has been mentoring delegates with GSMP for the last nine years. Please, a big round of applause for both Brenda and now Susan. Come on up here, Susan. There she is. Ah, I love this. Uh, me too. Susan, how did you first get involved? Because I'm sure there are a lot of people out here going, I want to mentor someone. I want to be part of this. So how did you get into it? Well, it was at the 2012 summit. I learned about the program then, went back, talked to Laura Gentile, talked to the State Department, went back to the NHL and said, we have to be involved in this program. Yeah. So anybody who hears about it tonight, and is interested, get involved. It's yeah. an amazing program. Oh, what's been the best part about it for you guys? You know, I would say as much as people talk about mentoring amazing women, these women are incredible. Our organization has gotten so much out of everything we have been through. We learn so much from everyone that has come and spent time with us, including Brenda. These women are resilient and brave. All the things that we heard about earlier today, the things we all need to do and be in order to make mm. change, these women come here and they're doing it. And mm. they're so incredible. And it's just a reminder when we think about the challenges we face, we take for granted the opportunities we have in the United States mm -hmm. and the organizational infrastructure, government entities, just physical education in schools. The things we all just are part of our life don't exist in many countries mm -hmm. around the world. And so for, for the work Brenda's doing, she's starting with a clean slate, but she has to build it because yeah. it doesn't exist in oh. Mexico. Let's hear what you're building, Brenda. <laughs> I want to hear about this. What is your action plan? Uh, my action plan specifically is uh, we're going to do a multi-sport tournament in Mexico just for women and girls, a yearly event. Nice. Multi-sport Multi well. Yeah, and we're going to Mexico City, and the plan is to then do it in other cities so that eventually we also get to uh, map out the women and sports ecosystem in the country because there's no data that uh, has that registered anything about women or girls practicing sport. And it's mainly to give them access and expose them to different activities in safe spaces. Yeah. When, when just to, to give some background, too, for, for people, because I, I do think, to Susan's point, we take for granted the opportunities we have here in this country yeah. and afforded in large part by Title IX. What is the atmosphere like for a young girl who's coming up and wants to be a football player, for example, in Mexico? What, is she, what does she encounter? Well, fo football is uh, a specific case in Mexico because we're a very football, well, soccer country. Maybe that was uh, a bad example. Yeah, No, but it, it's true. Like, uh, we don't have the institutional framework from the government in terms of having the building blocks for girls to go through the phases of sport. Just like starting with your physical development and learning how to move your body, literally. So it's a very privileged space. Only if you have money and your parents have the time and the resources to, give, to take you to sport, do you get the chance. So it's, it's more about uh, tackling that, but also giving them safe spaces due to all the uh, information that we uh, know about in different spaces because that is crucial for us to like for the parents to know that they can take their girls to a safe space for them what kind of change do you envision when you have this competition this multi-sport competition well for me the most important part is for them to be in a space where they feel free I think sport gives us that freedom 
I think it's the only space where we can actually project our true selves and our mm -hmm. true personality uh, without any kind of cultural or societal uh, ties. And I just want to give that to girls because for me, passion for us has been like limited. And when a woman taps into her passion, magic happens, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. You know the magic as well that happens is the dots that are connected from country to country and year to year. And the thing that always strikes me when I, and I meet the girls and I meet them every day, different year and I stay in touch with a lot of them is that there is this sisterhood and this family. So beyond what you're doing in your country, you're also now turning and pulling and helping others yes. in other countries because you now have this network and it just keeps expanding. The rings keep growing, right? Yes. What is it about that sisterhood that you've noticed over the years that's so powerful? <laughs> So I think also something very important, and we talked about that, the fact that you meet women with your same fears and passions and dreams and obstacles is crucial because then you don't, don't feel alone. Even if you're in another country, just having the possibility now to tap a WhatsApp and share what you're going through, it's very powerful. And building these networks today, I think it's more powerful than ever, especially after what COVID, uh, you know, Detonated in the yeah. in the whole world, so I think detonated is a really good yeah. word, actually. <laughs> yeah, so I think this generation specifically is going to be very different because now we are, have a very different mindset about very different things, and we're special. We know it. <laughs> they are. They are. They are. Yeah. You are special. You know what? I, I'm not kidding when I say like that moment with you all on stage yes. is my favorite visual of every ESPNW Summit. Because, and, and I want to commend all of you in the audience because I know so many who have done this turning and pulling for so many years, which is so important. But it's these young women who are going to run with it and make this world Absolutely. what it really should be. And there's... In inclusivity and hope and equality and all these things that you guys are going to get done as you've seen from the sisterhood you're building. And I just can't thank you enough for spending the time with us here. I know it's really hard to come to Ohio Valley Inn. Uh, yeah, very. <laughs> we have been having a hard time. I know it's a hard time. Hardship. Yeah. Hardship. Uh, best of luck in your last week in D.C. with your project planning. And Susan, thank you for all of you've given for nine years and all of the other in the audience who have been a part of this program. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, they're so good. You guys, you guys are amazing. You really are. All right. Spainer, get on up here with those heels. Let's see them. Ah! Now I'm on that rock star shit. It's slightly <laughs> different than vigilante shit. That's okay. all I am now, Fowdy. God, I'm like That's this. That's all I am. I'm like this. I'm like Chanae up here. <laughs> um, I have a really quick funny story about GSMP. So when they did that White House thing, since we heard Midge Purse's White House story, um, I got to host this 10th anniversary celebration and Title IX celebration with the First Lady, which, can you believe that they trusted me? I had to go through like secret service checks and stuff. So I get there, we go through a full rehearsal at Capital One. Everything is going perfectly. I'm learning how to read off of one of those bulletproof teleprompters, which was so cool. I was like, oh my God, I'm basically the president. So <laughs> everything is going great. I have to learn how to pronounce 40 names of women from every country. You notice how they always introduce themselves here? No, no. That was on me, okay? So now I've rehearsed 40 full names of every country possible. I'm ready to read off the bulletproof teleprompter. Things are great. I come back after rehearsal, fully dressed, ready to rock it with BJ Key, BJK and, and Joe Biden. And they come up to me, they're like, so I um, just wanted to let you know that the teleprompter operator has COVID. Um, so he has been sent home, but we have someone else and it's totally fine. I'm like, awesome, great. Like, also, um, Joe Biden is significantly shorter than you, so we're just gonna drop down your teleprompter a little bit, but the angle should be fine. You'll be able to see. I'm like, okay. <laughs> you will not be surprised to learn that the backup teleprompter guy had actually never run a teleprompter. 
that the angle was not, in fact, fine. <laughs> and also that it didn't matter because the word stopped within the first page. So Rachel Epstein was like, hey, you should bring your cards up there just in case. I was like, I mean, we did the rehearsal. It was great. She's like, ah, just in case. So I'm like in the middle of a sentence, and I'm like, I'll just wait for him to catch up, vamp a little. Never caught up, never came back. I'm like, cool, all right, and here we are at the White House with Joe Biden. Everything's not working out great. Um, but we made it. Most people didn't notice. I consider that a success. And speaking of success, hell of a transition, Spain. Oh, look, the chairs are set up. Um, <laughs> Let's get to tonight's amazing interview, amazing performance. I'm already so excited for this. I just saw her at Innings Fest a couple of months ago, and I know she's absolutely going to crush it. But more than that, she is fascinating. Uh, Annie Clark is the real name of the woman behind St. Vincent. She has released six solo records. She's a three-time Grammy Award winner. She sings, she plays guitar, bass, piano, organ, and more. She was a member of the psychedelic pop band Polyphonic Spree before her solo career. She recorded an album with Talking Heads leader David Byrne, was a member of Suff Jan Stevens' touring band. She's collaborated with everyone from Taylor Swift to Paul McCartney to Bon Iver. She fronted Nirvana for Lithium when they got inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. She's filled in as the band leader for Late Night with Seth Meyers. She has a film directorial debut on the women-directed anthology Horror XX. She co-wrote and starred in the psychological thriller The Nowhere Inn. You've seen her on Portlandia. She's got a capsule collection with Gant. She fronted a Tiffany campaign. She's got her own master class. And she's got, got more in front of her. And that includes tonight when we get to talk to her, the incredible Annie Clark, AKA St. Vincent. Oh my gosh, I mean, I had to whittle it down. Your Wikipedia is long and presumably mostly correct. I feel like my mother edits it. So. Yeah? Uh, I'm glad my mom doesn't know what my Wikipedia says. I have to check in every once in a while and erase stuff. Uh, all good. Let's get to your growing up because I'm fascinated by your incredible, singular, super unique career. And I don't know that I would have placed you as a born in Tulsa, raised in Dallas gal and as an athlete growing up. So tell us about your sports background first. Absolutely. So yes, I was born in Tulsa and lived there till I was eight. And I mean, it's just sports is what we did. Yeah. Like there wasn't a question. It was like, you are playing soccer. Um, and then when I moved to Texas, I kept on going, played basketball. I played volleyball. Right. I was a point guard. No big deal. No big deal. Um, Where's Becky Hammond? You want to take her on? She <gasps> might still be around. No, I do not. <laughs> um, I played all the sports, track and field. It was just, I mean, in Texas, there is a very big sports culture. Um, but also, we were, you know, really encouraged to just be competitive and athletic. Yeah. And you're still a sports fan, but we don't have to talk about your NBA team because it's not going great. <laughs> Everyone already knows who we're talking about. Well, actually, there's two options, really. Uh, the one that didn't just fire Steve Nash. Oops. Uh, the one that's setting records for three-point futility. Uh, we don't need to talk about them. Um, you got a red plastic guitar from Target for Christmas when you were just five. You also had some family members in the music biz. So this sort of helped facilitate the transition from sports to really diving into music and writing. So can you talk about some of your early influences? Oh, yeah. I mean, the first time I heard Jimi Hendrix, I was like, ah, I'm a goner. That's <laughs> it. Um, but yeah, my aunt and uncle are a jazz duo called Tuck and Patty. So I knew that guitar and guitar playing was something you could sort of do. It was elusive still, but you could do it for a living. So I was like, oh, I want to do that. You know, and I, uh, I was uh, obsessed with basketball and, and football. I was pretty good QB, no big deal. But, <laughs> um, but when I started playing guitar when I was 12, just that became my complete and total obsession. Yeah. And I, I mean, musically, who were, else were you listening to? And did you try to write like them when you were young or were you instantly like, I want to think outside the box? Um, I, I mean, I have so many favorites, you know, uh, 
I think my early years were like the early 90s. So we're oh, talking like, like prime. Yeah. I feel lucky. That was a good yeah. that was a that was a golden era. I do yeah. I do think. Um so, you know, you're talking Nirvana. You're talking Pearl Jam. Uh mm-hmm. you're talking Soundgarden. You're talking like a you're lot talking of, all of our favorites. Yeah. yeah. So all these all these bands where, you know, guitar was really a forefront of the music. And I think if I had been born in another time, I might have just been like, well, I have a laptop and that's what I do. You know, right. you, we are a product of our. Right. You would be crushing Minecraft. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so you went on to go to Berklee College of Music in Boston, a very traditional path for musicians, a really excellent school, but you left there before graduating. And you said of that choice, I think that with music school and art school or school in any form, there has to be some system of grading and measurement. The things that they can teach you are quantifiable. All that is good and has its place. At some point you have to learn all you can and then forget everything that you learned in order to start actually making music. That seems to jive really well with your unique perspective towards songwriting and creating. Can you tell us more about kind of that moment in your life? Sure. Well, I mean, like all schools, when I went into Berkeley, there was a a, a, a grading system. There was a, how do you, how do you say? Uh, uh, how do you say grading? I think, um, like a, yeah, they gave you a grade on on what you did and maybe it felt like a tri- more ephemeral like a than that or... Oh, audition. Or, and, well, an audition, but an audition where they... Is this they the $10,000 you... pyramid or $100,000? No, I'm so how sorry. Many, <laughs> how many thousands are in it? <laughs> um, but they, they, you do this audition, and then you get a score from okay. you know, yeah. 1 to 10, right? And I went in with twos, and Whoa. I left with twos. Oh, no. Because I was just, uh, you know, there's so much more to, to being an artist and, and being a creative that that while having the skills and sort of the know-how and know the rules is very helpful, you have to unlearn everything like that to to really forge your own path. So that's kind of why I left. Yeah. Yeah. Um, You ended up going back and living with your parents for a bit, and it was around that time, hey, (laughs) haven't we all? I might be doing it soon. You never know what's going to come next. you end up with this theatrical, artistic choral rock band called Polyphonic Spree. How many people in here remember them with the robes and all of the instruments and the... I remember being so moved by their performances because there was more to it than just the music. That wasn't just a good, great job that was affirming to you. That really came at the right time. That came at the right time. So I had dropped out of college. I moved to New York, which I don't know if you guys know, but it's very expensive. <laughs> And heard that. Yeah. yeah. So I uh, I moved back in with my parents with my tail between my legs. And um, I was lost, actually, for the first time in my life. For the first time in my life, I was like, I have this dream, but I don't know if I'm going to get there. Which, you know, to I'm sure as you guys all know, as great athletes and makers, it's like you have to have this... Uh, unreasonable amount of confidence Mm -hmm. that what you what you do is going to work out right you're like yeah of course I'm going to be in the WNBA (laughs) like period full stop so um that's what I had with music but then it kind of didn't pan out exactly how I thought it would or when I thought it would but within two months no two weeks sorry of moving back to Dallas with my parents I um, had a friend who was like, hey, the Polyphonic Spree's looking for a guitar player. You want to try out? And I was like, hell yeah. So I go to Guitar Center. <laughs> I buy a bunch of guitar pedals that I'd never used and didn't know what they did. And I learned all the songs and I show up at the tryout. And after the tryout, the lead singer's like, hey, Anna, you got a passport? I said, yes. He goes, you're going to Europe. So Amazing. I was on tour, you know, a week later. It's just that easy. It's, you just yeah. go to Guitar Center. It's just that easy. Yes, I'm. Thank you so much to our sponsor, Guitar Center. <laughs> um, that's incredible. Okay, so now you're touring with a band in Europe, and you're living the life you had dreamed of, at least musically making a living, which yeah. is a start. Um, you become a solo artist after a number of other steps, and you become Saint Vincent. And I want to start by talking about actually the most recent album. 
2021's Daddy's Home. Um, it explores a topic that you had previously not wanted to necessarily discuss. It had been talked about without really your consent, and you had sort of let it sit, and then you decided for this album you wanted to open up, and that's your father's decade in prison for financial crimes. You wanted to address it in this, and I wonder how that subject matter and that decision to be opening up about that time period not only informed the music, but the time period that inspired the sort of persona, the the costumes, everything that came on Daddy's Home. Yeah, I mean, art's a strange thing, right? Because you have these instincts to do, to go down a path. And, and only in hindsight do you really know why. Um, and I think in some really bizarre kind of mystical way, songs are prophetic. In my experience, if I write a song that you know is imaginary, hasn't really happened, it kind of ends up happening in, in my life. And I'm not particularly woo-woo or anything like that, whatever. We're in Ojai though, so it's okay. Oh, okay, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> my crystal shop is just yeah. down. It's open when the moon's aligned. Yeah. <laughs> Which is rare. Um, no, so, but I, for some reason, you know, I, my father was really the one who introduced me to a lot of great music and music that I have loved forever, right? So, and it's the music of the 70s. I mean, it's music, it's Stevie Wonder. Mm. Um, it's, you guys have heard of him. Yeah, he's good. Stevie, we're talking Stevie Wonder, Steely Dan, Fly in the, uh, Sly and the Family Stone. I mean, just like the shit that fucking grooves. Like it's yes. just, it's yeah. real. And so, um, and it's real players like playing mm -hmm. in a room. And it's, so anyway, I, I decide uh, somewhere along the line to make a record called Daddy's Home that is sort of an homage to a lot of the music that he introduced me to, but also is this kind of traces the arc of my own kind of uh, coming into my power and kind of like the roles reverse. You guys know if you have parents, suddenly you're like, you're the parent and they're mm -hmm. the child. So, you know, so in this way, it was like, I'm going from a kind of candy darling, um, Jenna Rollins and woman under the influence kind of character into like, I'm daddy now. Oh, okay. So. Yeah, you've talked about that transition on the album is it, it you become the daddy yourself. I got bills. I got bills. <laughs> Um, also, you mentioned when people really could play and your on stage performances, your live performances on this most recent tour have been much more collaborative. It's really a conversation between you and the musicians as opposed to a, a solo St. Vincent with a backing band. Is that informed by the music? Definitely. I mean, the music of that time, it's it's loose. Like I always think of the vibe of that record or that time as like, sitting back into a very comfortable leather chair and you've got like whatever your drink of choice mound of coke oh not <laughs> oh sorry not, just me uh, not for me but sarah yes yeah. you yeah yeah just rails and rails rails hoover it up sarah <laughs> but um <laughs> but you know just like you're just like leaning back yeah and you got a little debt and you're just it's comfortable and you and you're able to kind of walk into the world and like live in it in a very easy way. And that doesn't mean it, it's without depth or double entendre or all right. kinds of things, but it's it's kind of a little smooth. psychedelic yeah. smooth world to walk into. I mean, you feel it on the album so much and also in the persona you take on. And um, I want to get into that because one of the best parts for me as a fan of yours is the personas you take on for the album and how the visuals and the onstage performance and the costumes all pair with the music. And this is her description, this is not mine. I won't take credit for these. So Strange Mercy, your persona was housewife on pills. Saint Vincent was near future cult leader. Mass seduction was a dominatrix at the mental institution. And this one, Daddy's Home, Gina Rollins in a Cassavetes film. So when you're imagining those archetypes and writing the music and creating, how does that, which comes first in terms of the music and the performance style? I mean, to me, the music always comes first and I just kind of let it emerge and you know figure out what it is that I'm trying to say or create. Because honestly, I don't know about you guys, but I, 
half the time I walk around the world and I don't know what I feel. Mm. I don't know what I think. And it's only really when I'm able to make something that I go, oh yeah, mm. that's what's going on inside me. That's, that's what's happening. So I let the music, I lead, let the music lead the way. And then um, certain themes kind of emerge. And then it just, it's not that I'm adopting a total persona. They're all kind of parts of me, but you know, it's, I want to put on a show. Mm. And I, I love the quotidian, but I mean, we have enough of that. Yeah. Like I, I would rather put on a show. I personally want to go to outer space and to heaven and to hell for an hour and a half. <laughs> and I hope that, you know, everybody else <laughs> wants to go there too. And I just kind of have to trust that people do. Yeah. Um, you've actually described your onstage performance as the goal is to either shock or comfort, which sounds like that's where you're living. Like you're either sitting back in that leather chair or you are wearing all leather <laughs> and like can't move. Well, I think it's a combination of both, right? When you go see a show, it's like sometimes, you know, sometimes you're like somebody's mother and you're like, it's okay. Everything's going to be okay. I love you. And then sometimes you're like, nah, fuck this. Let's fuck this up. And like, <laughs> let's get confrontational and like, let's let id completely yeah. just fucking ride out into a fucking acid sunset. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and, and you I have do. to do both. I do and know. And so your job is to go, is to go, <laughs> here we are. We're safe. Oh no, we're not safe. Yeah. We're safe, we're not safe. I love but it. But at the end, you know, hopefully people walk away. I mean, the, the worst thing to me would be that people would see a show and go, yeah, it was cool. I'm like, oh, oh that, that was fine, that was nice. <laughs> that, sounded, that was pretty. Yeah. I mean, she has a nice voice. Oh, yeah. she's, she seems nice. She's talented, you know, that one. Uh, you know, she's just talented. Like, we're, gonna, we're all gonna die. <laughs> Let's have some fun on the way. Let's do it. All right. Right? Fowdy, Fow you're off the hook, because that was like five F-bombs. Oh, trust me, I don't care. It, ESPN is a Disney company. I don't know if anyone, yeah. It's cool. I hope that's one of your future personas, is like coked out Minnie Mouse or something. I can already see it. Um, I want to talk about something that we're, one of your collaborators uh, said. So legendary artist, Talking Heads frontman, David Byrne, said of you in 2013, and you created a full album together and toured together everything. Despite having toured with her for almost a year, I don't think I know her much better, at least not on a personal level. Mystery is not a bad thing for a beautiful, talented young woman or man to embrace, and she does it without seeming to be standoffish or distant. Was your mysteriousness intentional? And do you still try to be mysterious? I do think that David would have a different thing to say now. I think we've... Uh, you dated, right? So I would hope he would seem like he knew you a little ab better. Absolutely. Right, right. Okay, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it's how I got my start in the music business. Yeah. Ladies, take note. Yeah, that's so funny because that's how I got in this business too. Oh my God. With David Byrne though, which was weird because he's not really in sports. So proud of you. Yeah, thank you. Get it, girlfriend. Yep. Go after what you want. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Everybody see Triangle of Sadness. <laughs> anyway, uh, no, I mean, David, at the time when I was on tour with him, I was, I was like shy and really intimidated. So, and also probably clinically depressed. <laughs> so I kind of was, I was more reserved, you know, I wasn't necessarily going out and, and he's my hero too. So I, I wasn't really sure how to approach him like a person. Right. Um, but since then, I like to think that we are friends and I love him dearly. So mystery is not the intention, it's just the occasional result of shyness slash depression. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> I've never been called mysterious. <laughs> I talk too damn much to be mysterious. <laughs> Nothing is left to question. Um, so I'd mentioned that latex from the Mass Seduction tour. You threw yourself into the audience almost every night um, on your 2011 tour. The latex made that a challenge, so you didn't do that as much on Mass Seduction. But I saw in an interview you said it, it was almost painful just to shrug your shoulders while wearing that. 
so it feels like the athlete in you is still presenting challenges, whether that's crowd surfing or whether that's the requirements of the costumes. So how much do you actually see your touring and your performance as athletic performance? You guys, I mean, not nearly <laughs> as much as you, but I, I train to go on tour. I'm like, it's an athletic pursuit. You know, you the last thing you want to do is be on stage going for it and then like, oh, sorry, guys, got to take a breather to, you know, <laughs> huff it out. You know, it's <laughs> like you're you're in the moment. And so whatever energy happens, you have to be able your body has to be physically able to rise to that occasion and in many instances up the ante. So um, for me, mass seduction, that particular record was a lot about power and um you know the the freedoms and the constraints of power personally you know politically sexually all these things so it's like i felt like i needed to be constrained by my clothing on stage mm. i needed it to be as uncomfortable as possible i needed i i mean my ass was amazing but <laughs> um <laughs> just it's gone now but it, but <laughs> but it was it was really about like a little bit of suffering and a little bit of right. grit and like almost having to work through a physical challenge just to be on stage and to mm -hmm. sing and so i i don't know again all these things make sense you know when in hindsight <laughs> but at the time i was like nope i'm wearing nothing but latex which P.S. does not breathe. <laughs> um, we saw your ass, actually. Well, lots of times. But did everyone see the duet with Dua Lipa at the Grammys that was very, like, Robert Palmer with the, oh, my gosh, that was hot. That was, that was during the latex phase. You remember. Um, so I saw you at Innings Fest out in Arizona a couple months ago, and you ended up being um, sort of the opener right before the Foo Fighters. And it was one of the last shows with Taylor Hawkins. And I know you got to spend some time with the band right before. What was, what was that like for you? And um, how ephemeral does it sometimes feel in an industry where there is a lot of loss or uh, struggle? I mean, I think, I think in life, especially as you go on, there's more and more loss. And there is there all these cliches that people say suddenly make sense when you've experienced a loss, you know, like, oh, they live through you or, mm. um, you know, they're never their spirits never gone. And when you're not close to loss, you kind of go, oh, yeah, OK, like, I, yeah, there's a cat hanging on a poster and that's the <laughs> slogan. Sure. But. Um, but it's but it's true. And I mean, I. Listen, I, I was very fond of Taylor. I didn't know him that well. But I know that the kind of kinship and brotherhood that those guys had as a band, there's, not, there's nobody, you know, there's, there's no replacing him, mm -hmm. right? You can make something new, but... There's no replacing him, and he was a he was a great dude. Again, I didn't know him that well. I can't. Uh, I don't want to uh, presume anything too much. But man, he was an inf an infectious dude. Yeah, he was great, and we got to hang that that time. And uh, he was a good dude and an incredible performer. An yeah. incredible performer. I want to ask you because you mentioned that Nirvana was one of your influences growing up. You already mentioned you made an album with your hero, so no big deal. Totally stress free and David Byrne, but then you front Nirvana at their Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction. I can't imagine, right? Clap it up for that. That's insane. I can't imagine that you get nervous that often. I don't want to presume, but that's got to be one where you're like flipping out a little. No, that was I. I, I was egregiously nervous. I mean, that was <laughs> no. I mean, really, and and to be honest, I mean, when you have the opportunity to, as I'm sure you guys have you guys are heroes for people and then you've also met your heroes right and so you find yourself in this like actually beautiful full circle mm. You're like i i wouldn't be here playing music if it wasn't for you and somehow now i get to be part of you know your legacy and it's it's uh, i still and it's been eight years now but i still don't really have words for it and i don't really have a place to put it 
Yeah, yeah. that's incredible. Um, you have done a lot of those unique performances, a ton of super interesting collaborations. And I wonder when you start a new project with somebody, how much of it is a feeling out for like, how do you do this work versus how do I do it? When do you feel like you defer? When do you feel like you take over? How do you decide that early on in those collaborations? Well, I think like part of being an artist, oh geez, that was a bad die job. Um, but I think part of <laughs> part of being an artist is is yes. like an extreme. <laughs> there it is. There's I'm your sorry. ass. There are yeah. There are pictures. I am seeing these <laughs> pictures. They're not just pointed at you. So I'm gonna I'm gonna look up just sort of yeah here. just sort of to the yeah Sarah <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> but <laughs> I lost your question was um yeah it was about collaborations so and then they were like shame. perfect let's show all these photos and then it was real yeah uh no I think as an artist there's like there are time there's again this bizarre yin yang of extreme confidence and also extreme comfortability mm -hmm. or discomfort mm -hmm. or somewhere in between all of the above with absolute mystery. And so, and also I just, I mean, I'm one of like a gazillion kids. So I have <laughs> brothers and sisters. And so I think there are times when you know, I'm I'm relating to people and relating to collaborators in a way that's like, oh yeah, I'll just like, like I w I'm gonna kiss the ring right now. And other times it's like, no, 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 I think it should be this. But it's really again, you know, about power and knowing how to sort of wield it. And wielding power isn't always about, you know, clubbing someone over the head. Right. It's right. about you know, sleeping your way to the top. Of like, course, like, yeah, we, like did. we did. Yeah. So. <laughs> the feminine wiles. Um, that's hilarious. That's ridiculous. Um, I hope we clip off just that part. Just that part. And I want it to go viral. Um, so you've done all these incredible things. Again, acting, directing, fashion, everything, what's another challenge or what's in the future that you are creatively inspired by? Um, I mean, I guess I only want to do things that are a challenge that feel like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to wade into waters that are probably too deep and not really know if I can swim and figure that out. Cause I don't think you get better. I mean, again, athletes, you don't get better doing the same routine every mm -hmm. time. You gotta push it. You gotta go past your limit. Um, and also, I mean, just an aside, like no one gets better at being an artist by surrounding themselves with people who are like, that was amazing. <laughs> that's the best. Yeah. Oh my God, you know, that's yeah. not. So you don't, obviously don't surround yourself with guest men or women. Or non-binary people. Or non-binary. Non -bi yeah. um, and so, don't surround yourself with people who are just like, yes, mm -hmm. you know, push it and push it out and, and, and really kind of go to the edges of what you can do and what you think you can do and just jump off the cliff, man. Yeah. How do you know when people are giving you constructive criticism that you should take and they're not giving you the yeses you're looking for and you trust their center and their view of what you're making? And how do you know when you believe deep down that what you're doing is true to you and, and right? I think it's just instinct and instinct that you hone over a lot of years of doing the thing you love. And there's certain times when you can hear from someone like, mm, I'm not sure about that chorus. And you're like, no, 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 mm -hmm. this is the thing. But then also, I mean, this is a little bit of an aside, but sometimes I'll have friends and musician friends who I love, like come and listen to things that I'm working on. And you can actually feel the energy of when mm. their attention wanders. Mm. When and it's musicians. I mean, as you know, yes, obviously non musicians, that's helpful too, but right. you know, people whose work you also love, when they start to go, uh huh, you know, mm. then you go, Ah. Oh, I lost them. I yeah. I lost them and Interesting. And I, f I had a feeling that that's when I would lose them and so I'm gonna rectify it. 
Oh, that's fascinating. Well, we can't wait to see what you do next. I mean, this Daddy's Home tour kind of continues, right? You've got more stuff coming up, or is it wrapped? No, it's kind of so done. So now we wait for a full another album and everything else. No pressure. <laughs> you like, just started relaxing. I'm like, all right, let's go. <laughs> Snap to it. Um, well, we are in for such a treat. I'm so excited to hear you perform again. I'm so excited for all of you to hear her. And thank you so much. This was so much fun. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Let me take that mic from you. One more time for the incredible St. Vincent slash Annie Clark. I think these folks are gonna move a bunch of stuff. I don't know if you wanna. Yeah, you're fantastic. So good. Um, yeah, let's make sure all the most dangerous things are off the stage for what's gonna happen. Um, all right, so this is what happens for musical performances here at the summit. Everyone's very comfortable, everyone's on their couches, nobody wants to get up, everyone just had a full bottle of wine. That's fine for some people, but I think you just heard what this woman has accomplished. And I think if you sit on your asses while she's working her ass off, I'm gonna be a little bit... Yep, see, here we go. This is what I'm looking for. You don't have to stand the whole time if I don't know you got a bad leg or a long-standing sports injury uh, or the wine's out of reach, but I'm expecting a really big bunch of energy for this. So let's hear it for St. Vincent. I would just like to say, you guys are under no obligation for me to stand. <laughs> when the earth split in two, I was I, you were
Thank you. Oh, thanks. There we go. Thank you. This song's called New York. It's 
about a little city. You guys probably haven't heard of it. But when I wrote it, I was thinking about um, how the blocks pretty much stay the same. You just walk in this little square, right? But you change so much over the course of this little, just this block. And you look at the block over there and you're like, oh, that's a bodega where I fell in love. And you're like, oh, over there, that's like a, oh, that's the coffee shop where we broke up, you know? And like, oh, oh the avenue that I stumbled back from. So many nights. New York is a New York without you, love. So much for a home, for a home. I'm going to start that verse again because I'm pretty sure I sang it in Esperanto. New York is in New York without you, love. So far in a few blocks to be so low. And if I call you from first avenue, where the only motherfucker in the city. Oh, I 
Thank you. my wrist um, recently um, and 
I don't see that as some sort of like cop out that performers do where they're like, I'm really sick. I hope it, I, but I want to tell you that I hurt my wrist playing um, basketball with 11 year olds. And there was a game, and it was called um, Divas and Daughters, which, I mean, I think we kind of all object to that name to be, like, it's a, the premise is specious to begin with, but, um, but it was for 11-year-old girls and their uh, mothers or aunts. In this case, I have to be, happen to be an aunt. aunt. And um, so anyway, we start playing this game. There are rules, right? There's the um, no full court press, <laughs> right? There's the uh, only adults can guard adults and only children can guard children, right? That makes sense. And on each possession, like the child has to shoot first, right? You can't just fucking, bleh, you know. Um, so great, love it, love rules. So I start playing and there's a, a mother from the other team who is setting full fucking picks on the children. And I see her throw her hip out to trip my niece. She is not abiding by the no full court press rule. She is creating jump balls with children and she's shooting first. So um, me as a reasonable adult, I see this, I recognize the injustice, I start to get angry and I'm guarding her and I go up for a rebound and I fucking elbow her in the face. But besides that, but beyond that, but besides that, I <laughs> I lost my cool. And I think you guys know, like you, I mean, I don't know how much trash talk is like a part of the game or what. But I tell this mother of three to get your fucking hands off me. <laughs> and I was ejected from the game. So. But I felt like I could share that story safely here. And her form was bullshit. Well, you had paid your dues 
Jones and put a payday into your uniform. Wow, born innocent, but some good saints get screwed. Well, hell, where can you run when the outlaws inside you? I'm a 
one and then you can continue to enjoy the charcuterie. <laughs> thank you for having me and thank you for all of your your hard work. I'm just being fucking badasses. Just bless you. Thank you so much, everybody. Good night. Let's go! Come on! How awesome!
was that? Dude, that was sick. That was sick. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for the incredible interview, for rocking our faces off. I already took my heels off because I needed to be able to move more freely to what you're doing. Um, you absolutely crushed it. One more big hand for St. Vincent, everybody. Incredible, I'm getting that guitar pick right now, actually. I'm gonna steal it right now. Nobody else is getting that one. Okay. You can be here for these boring announcements or you can leave, whichever is best for you, a rock god. Uh, no, I'd like to stand here and kind of be here for the last Okay, if you wanna, so yeah, if you wanna put in any, we've got, um, we've got a live stream audience to say goodnight to. Say goodnight, St. Vincent. Oh, goodnight. Yeah. Um, 9 a.m. Pacific tomorrow is when things start. Yes. Thank you so much. Amazing. I'll get the activity scheduled to you in the back. Okay. Um, by the way, L. Duncan, the live streaming audience isn't all on the East Coast. Excuse me, East Coast bias. You keep talking about that. There's live streamers right here in California that aren't here with us. So, 9 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Central, 12 p.m. Eastern tomorrow morning. Um, everyone here, if you signed up for morning sports, 7 a.m. sharp on the slide behind me. On the slide behind. Behind me, you'll be able to see where to go. Breakfast, 8.15 a.m., our first panel, 9 a.m. sharp. Tomorrow programming concludes at 11.30. Check out at noon. I have an awesome panel tomorrow amongst other people who I'm sure are also awesome, so be sure to stick around for tomorrow. Leave your bags at the front desk if you want to check out before the day starts, then you'll grab them on your way out. If you're on a shuttle to LAX, they leave at approximately 12.15 and 3 p.m. Pacific time. Let's get some drinks. Let's dance to Al Duncan's favorite tunes. Let's not go to bed at 9.30, you gigantic candy asses from last night. Let's go! It's probably really expensive, sorry. Julie Fowdy will sit down with Jocelyn Olive, Crystal Dunn, and Juliana Pena tomorrow when the ESPNW Women in Sports Summit returns. Like it's about it.